Wow. How do I follow that? What a, what a performance and what a day. This has been just a tremendous day. I've, I've been inspired and have gained so much from the talk so far. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, and I have been studying the brain now for all of my career since college days. I think all of us, when we think about the brain, we share the sense of awe and mystery and, 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 and are just uh, amazed by the power of the brain and how it defines us in so many ways, how it determines uh, who we are, our personalities, our likes, our dislikes, uh, in some mysterious way that we don't fully understand tend to be housed right here. But the other thing that's, that's so important that I think we're all keenly aware of is that nothing is more terrifying than when things go wrong with the brain. So when the brain begins to, dis, to uh, misfunction and, and we begin to have diseases that are associated with that. That's something that I became very keenly aware of very early in life with a, a very close friend who I spent almost every day with, fishing, uh, hanging out, doing a lot, of, a lot of things, but daily was with this close friend. And one day, in, during our teen years, uh, I got a call from his parents. They were frantic because he had disappeared, wondering where he was. Uh, and I had no idea. I had not seen him. But when he was found, uh, he was wandering around, incoherent, uh, out of touch with reality, and he had had a psychotic break, which was the beginning of a lifelong struggle that he had from which he never really recovered of schizophrenia. So it was a very typical incidence of schizophrenia with that adolescent onset and an absolutely devastating disease. But overnight, I saw my friend come from a very engaged person that I spent every day with to a person that I could not connect with and could not connect with me. Then there were other individuals, like my baby sister, clearly my best friend as a child. We were tight growing up, uh, spent as much time as we could together. Uh, and when she hit her teen years, she started struggling with severe depression. And that depression lasted for the rest of her life and actually ultimately uh, led to problems with substance abuse as she was trying to treat that depression and finally took her life at a very early age. So these things give a, a, a very strong reality to the power of the brain and the power of dysfunction of that brain. And then there are other recent examples, like my mother-in-law shown here in the left. This was a, a picture taken only uh, six or eight months before she died of brain cancer. She was treated here in Nashville by Reed Thompson, who was at this event last year. My, grand, my father in, in the middle there with my children and my sister Melody's uh, son, uh, who was a brilliant man who spent the last years of his life struggling with Alzheimer's disease before he passed away. My great nephew, Kai, shown here, who struggles with an autistic spectrum dis disorder, living here in Nashville. So we see these examples, and these are examples that are very real-life examples of the power of the brain, the impact, the sometimes devastating impact of disorders. But the thing that I think we all know, that all of you know, is that this is not my story. This is your story. This is a story that I think is shared by everyone uh, on this earth. And, and if you think of the diseases that we're thinking about and talking about, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar, it goes on and on, chronic pain disorders, whether it be back pain or some injury, uh, neuropathic pain, these diseases are impacting uh, literally millions of lives. And if you think of those diseases as in the thousand other diseases of the brain that I haven't had time to mention, I think that everyone can think about somebody that you know and you love that is impacted. I'd like to have you raise your hands. If when I name these diseases or one that I haven't named, if you know someone who's struggling with with uh, one of these brain disorders, I'd just like to see a, a raising of hands to see how many lives here that has impacted. And I think what, what we can see is just about everybody in this room is impacted. There are none of us that are immune from this, and if it's not happened yet, it is likely to happen at some point in our lives. So the good news is that we are at a place today in science where we understand the brain, we understand human disease at a level that's unprecedented. I 
couldn't imagine 10 years ago being where we are today in terms of our understanding. We now have a complete sequence of the human genome. Every potential drug target in our body, the sequence is known. We now know the genetic variation of individuals and individual cases of disease are becoming more and more clear so that theoretically we can target medicines for an individual and their disorder. We now have an ability to image the brain and look at activity of the brain uh, in diseased patients and see what has gone wrong and from that understanding begin to think about new medicines. The problem and, and what's discouraging is that this tremendous increase in our understanding has not translated into the medicines that we so desperately want to see appear and become available for, for treatment. If you look at the medicines now available, the FDA actually lists over 10,000 medicines that have been approved for use in the U.S. So when you go to your doctor, it sounds like a large arsenal of medicines that are available for, for that treatment. But when you look more closely at this, what you'll see is that these 10,000 medicines actually are represented by only 433 uh, distinct chemical substances, and what you have is different combinations, different formulations, acetaminophen, the active ingredient in Tylenol is in almost 400 of these medicines, for instance, and so it really narrows down to a very small number of medicines available. And most of those, or many of those, were approved before 1950, before we had this tremendous increase in our understanding of human disease. If we think about neuroscience, brain disorders, the major antidepressants that we use were discovered in the 1960s, and what we use today is still just a slight variant of those initial drugs. For Parkinson's disease, the mainstay of treatment is still a drug that was discovered in the 1950s. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on of relatively incremental advances that don't come close to tackling the issues that we so desperately want to see tackled. So the question is why? Why is it that we have this large increase in understanding? We understand the brain at a level we never have before, and yet uh, we are not able to translate that into new medicines. And I can't go into the details of all the reasons, but I think you can look at how medicines have been developed and begin to gain an understanding of just the sheer economics and the practical issues involved in taking that knowledge and translating it to a new treatment uh, that play a major role. If we look at the classical approach to discovering new medicines, that has led to most or many of the medicines that we have today, and I think I dare say most of the medicines trace their roots back to this approach, uh, it was actually a very simple approach. And that was that there were medicinal plants that had been in use by humans for centuries in many cases, many cases millennia. And we knew that those plants had medicinal properties. And what we did was we took those plants as we began to understand chemistry and had the tools to do that in the 1800s, early 1900s, identified the active component of that plant, and then synthesized that component and we had a medicine. So it was a very short path from identifying that molecule to having a new medicine that could be marketed. We then began to make improvements on those medicines, and so making modest improvements from those starting points, uh, new medicines began to appear. The problem with this is that while it has been extremely, uh, extremely fruitful, We've really mined this, this gold mine that has been available to humans. And if we think of the diseases that we're talking about today, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, different cancers, the things that we all struggle with, those are not diseases for which there are medicinal plants. So we can't rely exclusively on this model. So what we do today is we take a different approach that is critical in my view, and that is that we devote tremendous energy and resources to understanding these diseases, to understanding how the human body works and what goes wrong in a disorder. From that, we then develop a hypothesis that tells us that we might be able to develop a medicine if we target this molecule in the body or, or we develop a, an approach. But that's a hypothesis. So whereas the old approach started with a medicine, we now start with a hypothesis, and now we have to go through a tremendously expensive and difficult process of taking that hypothesis and moving it to uh, clinical use. 
Well, that process is extremely expensive, and this just shows the steps in that process, and I, I won't go through them in, in this context, but each step has uh, tremendous risk, and, lead, and there's a lot of failure. But the ultimate cost of developing a new medicine with this new approach today is $1.8 billion. Most of the programs that are initiated fail because of the difficulty of the process, and those that do make it all, all the way to the market, only three of 10 actually bring in enough revenue to pay for themselves. So it becomes extremely high risk, and from a business standpoint, uh, there are some that argue that it could be unsustainable. That's especially true in neuroscience, where uh, many companies have stopped their efforts in neuroscience because the risk is so high relative to some other therapeutic areas. So the problem with this is that there's a disconnect, in my view, between the traditional approach that we have taken in academic medicine and academic research and what occurs in uh, an industry setting to make new medicine. So traditionally, research occurs in universities, clinical care occurs in universities, and companies take that knowledge that comes from the universities and translate that into new medicines that are then marketed. The problem is that if you're working in a university setting with this model and you develop an idea, you don't have the ability to move it forward. And I just want to give an example of that. Uh, this is an example with Parkinson's disease. It's a paralytic disorder uh, that leads to tremendous difficulties for the patients. And this is a patient, her name is Sybil, who was at Emory University when I was on the faculty there. Uh, and she was being treated with surgical techniques that took advantage of an understanding we had of brain circuits that were overactive. And this is a patient of Malin DeLong and Jerry Vitek there. And I just want to show you a video of how this understanding led to development of a, a surgical treatment. So this is just pictures of her before her Parkinson's disease. Uh, she and her husband immigrated from uh, Jamaica. And then at a very early onset uh, age, she developed Parkinson's disease, was rendered virtually incapable of caring for herself. So even simple uh, tasks such as feeding herself, dressing herself, unable to stand unable, unaided, unable to walk without help. Uh, and this is maximally effectively treated with the currently available drugs. She then went in for surgery where, where there was a surgery to reduce excessive activity in one side of her brain. And you see this tremendous benefit of the surgery. So she's now able to stand unaided, to walk, uh, a, a tremendous gain of function. But that didn't completely reverse it. Now after going in the other side of the brain, this is the same patient, Sybil, who uh, after the bilateral surgery and just a tremendous regain of function. <clears throat> I, Sybil, last I heard when I last talked to Malin and Jerry, is still doing very well. It, it, that was in 1998. She's doing extremely well and just a, a life-altering surgery, obviously, for her. I don't think I look at this video without either wanting to laugh or cry, depending on, on my mood, but uh, very exciting. The problem is, is that Sybil and many other patients who received the surgery had to fit very strict criteria before they were eligible for the surgery, and only a few centers in the world could perform the surgery. So for people like Sybil, it was life-altering, but it was not available to the vast majority of Parkinson's patients. So we began to think about this from the perspective of a medicine and began to think of ideas for accomplishing the same thing with a medicine that you could swallow, it would get into the brain, have the same effects on this brain circuit, uh, and have major advantages over existing therapies. We spent several years doing that, profiling, looking for these druggable targets, neurotransmitter receptors and ion channels. We identified one that had all the properties we wanted. The problem we had is we were in a university and there was no way to take that further to a medicine. So I was so convinced that this was an approach that could work, and I was not able to do that in a university setting, and that was a large part of what prompted my move to a major pharmaceutical company where I was head of neuroscience and thought that in that setting I could have the influence to try something fundamentally new like this. The problem in the company setting is, for reasons that I am sympathetic with, 
uh, they saw this as too high risk. It had never been tried. The cost of investing in this is so high, uh, and, and, and it was just not something that even as an insider uh, in a company, we could get that off the ground and get the company and investors to agree to try that. So I began to think this problem through and came to the conclusion that the only way that this will be solved on a broad level, not just in this case, but in every case, is that we have to have translational efforts in universities where university investigators have the tools and equipment and the infrastructure normally available only in companies to take those ideas and move them closer to drugs with a major goal of de-risking these efforts so that uh, companies can afford to invest. So I moved to Vanderbilt. We developed the uh, Vanderbilt Center for Neuroscience Drug Discovery and built all of the infrastructure that is traditionally only available in a major pharmaceutical company with one primary mission, and that is to take advances in basic research and translate those to advances in clinical care. So put the infrastructure in place so that we can accomplish that and then de-risk investment in these in uh, a industry setting. The problem was there were no funding mechanisms in a university. University funding uh, it, it occurs by a, 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 a very established approach, and this type of work was not funded. So that was a problem when I came back to Vanderbilt. And was very fortunate when uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation decided to take a chance. Michael J. Fox is another individual that I see as just a truly inspirational person. His foundation invested in this approach, gave us the money we needed to develop molecules to see if this approach would work. And I'm happy to tell you that in September of 2011, we were able to announce that we now have drug candidates that are ready to move to clinical development for testing in patients uh, based on this concept, something that could have never been done in the traditional models and without the commitment of, of the Fox Foundation, uh, as well as the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and their tremendous investment. So very exciting, and that's only one example. We, in 2011, announced two fundamentally new approaches to treatment of schizophrenia that have, are now moving forward with corporate partners in te for testing in patients and for an autistic spectrum disorder, Fragile X syndrome. So this is very exciting in that it's the first of its kind in treatment of this type of childhood developmental disorder. So I want to end by just telling you a story uh, of another great nephew of mine. Uh, his name is Will. He lives in the Chattanooga area. And this is Will at the Forbidden City. Will was born with a uh, genetic defect that leads to a disease called cystic fibrosis, a very severe lung disease that ultimately over time will, pr will rob a patient from the ability to breathe. Will and his family were motivated, instead of being defeated, and began to invest in uh, working with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Uh, this is him running in a, an event for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Other people that are just tremendously inspiring, like Kathy and Joe O'Donnell, who lost their son to cystic fibrosis, began to invest in development of a new medicine with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who then... I uh, linked up with a company called Vertex, and in February of 2012, uh, Vertex announced that they had FDA approval for this new medicine. It happens to treat the exact mutation that Will has. Two weeks ago from today, today, Will took his first dose of this medicine, something we couldn't have imagined would occur when, when Will was born or over the last several years. I talked to his parents last week, and they told me that for the first time in two years, he is losing a cough that he has had chronically and some respiratory uh, problems. So after two weeks on this medicine, a, a huge impact on his life. So this is a daunting challenge. I wake up every day feeling uh, daunted by it. But what I will say is that we can all be involved at some level, whether running it for in something like Great Strides or doing anything in our sphere of influence to have an impact. And it is not insurmountable, but we all have to be serious about tackling these real problems to get to where we want to be. Thank you very much.